good morning and welcome to the Northern Institute and our People Policy Place Seminar. My name is Katrina Britnell and I'm the Partnerships Coordinator for Northern Institute. Thank you everyone for joining us today online and we have a few people um, here in our live, which is wonderful. Um, firstly, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today. For those of us in Darwin, it is the Larrakia Nation. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and further extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. Uh, today we have Dr Tracy Woodrop and Dr Joanna Funk here to discuss the progress and early findings from their HEP funded research project that investigates a pathway for First Nations students from VET DSS, which is VET delivered for secondary students, to a teaching career. So what we'll do is that uh, Tracy is going to go first and then Joanna. And at the end, if you have any questions or during, if you have any questions, can you please, if you're online, add it to the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And we'll also take questions, live questions for people in the audience today. So I'll now hand over to Tracy. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, it's our pleasure to tell you about our project and about um, sort of the foundational ideas and other research that's gone into, um, you know, really the focus on this particular topic for our project today. So we were very fortunate to um, apply for and be approved for some HEP funding and that's enabled us to investigate the potential of a pathway for First Nations students from uh, their studies in secondary school through to the potential of actually uh, enrolling and hopefully completing a degree here at CDU. So it's very much um, an internal focus. So our business and what we know, what we do at CDU and really looking at, you know, what's the options and, and how can we increase the potential and the chances or opportunities for our First Nations students in secondary schools looking to us, you know, as a provider for their teacher education training. And even, um, you know, it touches on those ideas of First Nations students actually thinking of, of themselves as being uh, higher education students and having the options or the opportunity to become a teacher. So our project um, sort of encompasses a lot of those broader ideas that we wanted to grapple and um, come to terms with and see how they're addressed or treated here um, within our city environment and that whole encouragement of, of um, secondary school students to look towards us. So thank you to Katrina, who's already done our acknowledgement of country, and I would like to reiterate that as well. So HEC, what is it? So it actually stands for the Higher Education Participation and Partnerships Program, and it's federal funding that is distributed to um, higher education institutions. And it has a number of different focus areas. This is the HEP uh, framework that you can see on the slide at the moment. And our focus is the second one to access pathways and admissions, admissions including enabling pathways. So looking at that, but really it overlaps into the next one as well, the participation. So when they're here, um, knowing the pathway, once you're here at CDU2, and then how you actually um, follow that pathway and um, successfully complete your teacher education training. So our project context. 
um, is outlined there clearly for you. Okay, so we're looking at making clear or making plain a pathway. So we're thinking of doing that in a visual way as well. So creating a map for students to follow easily. And, you know, uh, secondary students are also supported very closely by their parents or their guardians still. So making that process seem very visible and um, easy for students to be able to um, manoeuvre. So our research questions are, is there a clear pathway from VET DSS, so VET delivered in second, uh, to secondary students, through to a Bachelor of Education at CDU? Um, sometimes VET DSS is also called VETUS, so VET in schools. Those two terms are used interchangeably. So our second research question is, what are the enablers of success for such a pathway? How are Indigenous students successful in this pathway? And are there improvements to be made to engage more Indigenous students? So we've opted to use the term Indigenous. I may say Aboriginal. Um, they're interchangeable with First Nations as well. So some of our foundational thinking towards this project is based on these particular existing documents and the key points from each of those has been highlighted. So the Berent Review, of course, which was really the foundation for our thinking about increasing numbers of um, First Nations or Indigenous participation in higher ed and the need for that and the significantly lower um, parity there. Um, it also, that review also interestingly highlighted the importance of Indigenous hiring staff in supporting students in their journeys in that. Um, so the NT education engagement strategy. So goal two is what we're looking at there because that's about employing the right people. Okay, so being able to accelerate and expand programs, develop opportunities and pathways that attract, retain and promote Aboriginal educators. Very, very few Aboriginal educators in the Territory. There are programs such as the rate program which has been re-established looking at how to increase the numbers of remote um, Aboriginal teachers, um, majority of which um, have been working in schools as assistant teachers. So there are Indigenous people engaging with education and in schools as educators but not necessarily Having their experience and um, being acknowledged as teachers, so having to then upgrade to uh, Western expectations of what a teacher um, qualification might include. Um, so then there's our education NT strategy, which talks about continuing um, to be the most improving education system in Australia. So for me, that's, it sounds wonderful, but it's a little bit concerning because it still says we have so much more to improve, you know? Why, why are we still going to be the most improving? I'd love for something there to be stated um, more clearly towards, you know, attaining excellence or something like that. That would, for me, be more assuring. So we also know about the Matt City project and the um, report that came out of that in 2016 by Pugskin stated that the aims for that project were not achieved, okay? It was all about increasing the numbers of uh, Indigenous teachers and unfortunately it didn't, it didn't get traction throughout the whole of Australia was my impression. Um, there was more of an increased focus in particular concentrated um, larger urban areas, for example, in New South Wales. Um, but it was definitely stated in the final report that more work needs to be done in that space. Very, very few or a very, very low percentage of Indigenous educators was highlighted um, 
So there's lots to be done in the space about increasing numbers of First Nations teachers. And it does make sense to target students as they're coming through secondary school and they have those aspirations and even maybe concerns about what am I going to do when I leave here, you know? So that was me not too long ago. I was a, a student here at Casuarina High School thinking of what I was going to do next. Luckily, in year six, I decided I was already going to be a teacher, so had it all sorted. Um, and then finally, yeah, we had our National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Education Strategy from 2015 that highlighted the importance of transition points and pathways to post-school options. So you can see from 2012, we're still talking about very similar things and still needing lots of work to happen in that space. So this project really makes sense. So our progress and data collection. So we actually um, received our approval in early March, I think it was. We were expecting to hear back um, maybe in January or February. So it took us um, a month or two um, once we were notified of the approval to then um, formulate our plan and to get started on that. But our ethics application um, went through and so once that clearance happened, we could start to distribute surveys, think about our interviews, contact the education department, because we've also asked if we can speak with uh, NT government school educators, particularly those that are working in career education roles or uh, vet coordinators in, in schools to find out what they know or think about the pathway and the potential there. So I'm probably jumping a little bit ahead, I apologise, but that's the reasoning behind us needing to get approval from the department. And so we've conducted um, some interviews, we're hoping to do some more follow-up interviews. We have some survey data and we're continuing with our collection of data, but also um, mainly our focus now is on analysis of that. I would like to say up front as a little bit of an executive summary, we've moved through our um, project plan at a quicker rate than I thought because we've had less of a response than I was anticipating or hoping for. So at this early stage, one of the conclusions that we've come to is that there's very little information in the space. There's very few people who perhaps have thought of the potential of that pathway and, and um, so it's something that has gone um, sort of under the radar a little bit, not necessarily highlighted or focused on. And there's definitely potential for um, increasing our focus and the work done in that space. So that's kind of the, the message that we're getting at this um, early stage. But because of the low response rate, we're also now as a team considering what variation we may need to add to our ethics application if we need to try and um, recruit some more participants in a different way than what we've nominated. Um, yes, so that's what's what next. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Dr. Johanna Fuck, and she's going to talk to you about the Qualtrics cool survey. Thank you, Tracy. Hi, everyone. Uh, we got started with a Qualtrics survey uh, design that was mapped to our research questions, first and foremost. And a little bit going back, um, we actually had a seeding grant from the Rainmaker uh, Fund here at CDU, and we developed a bunch of um, principles from that Masidi uh, project and did a little bit of um, theoretical basis for that. And that also informed our research questions and approach. So. Um, when we got the news that we won the HEP grant, we started to collect 
contacts from the department and ideas about who at the CDU, uh, which which business units at CDU might be helpful in terms of gathering and um, to, you know contacting for completing as a survey. Um, and then what we did was draft a couple versions and test it out and um, of course had it aligned with the media uh, release of the First Nation Success website here at CDU uh, that went with the HEP program. So there were a lot of kind of collaborations along that lines to ensure that our, um, our survey distribution was thorough enough. We shared it with CDU staff first because we had CDU ethics clearance first. And we of course needed to wait until the department approved um, our, our ethics application with them. Um, but yes, we, we shared it uh, on the website and we shared it directly to staff who are involved in education programs at CDU. And then Tracy, um, got on to the department staff and um, executives in the department and also any schools, government other schools in the Indian territory and um, sent those out a couple of times as well with reminders. Um, we wanted to, to acknowledge too that there was industrial action happening in schools while we were doing data collection. And so we understand that that may have had an impact on the amount of data we could collect because people were working to work. All right, so this is uh, survey uh, hits. This includes test hits, um, but you can see uh, that there were a lot of um, CDU staff. The CDU students and graduates, um, that, that's a very low number, but it also includes some test hits, um, but it's not, these, these rep represent just logins, not completions of surveys. Um, all right, so that's a, a kind of a funny graph, but there's some more data coming in the next one. So out of CDU students, the First Nation Student Support Office sent the survey to 200 First Nation students, and we had zero completion. Um, we had 88 staff members at CDU uh, sent the survey, and seven completed. Three agreed to interviews. Um, and then we followed up with more kind of direct contact with CDU st uh, staff and colleagues to see if they were interested. And we, we got some more completions and um, interviews that way. Uh, we circulated, we sent the, the NT government um, departmental leadership because it's their job to distribute um, this material uh, amongst their, their colleagues. And um, two people completed that. And out of 54 schools in the Northern Territory that uh, Tracy sent the survey to, uh, we had eight complete surveys and two people agreed to the um, So this is a bit more information about the interviews so far. Uh, we've got eight completed so far, and I think that we've got one or two more people that have been away on leave that um, we're going to try and track down. And also with the variation Tracy was talking about, um, we have some other strategies that we're thinking about for the next round of funding to be applied for. One interesting quote from one of the interviewees um, who is quite heavily involved um, with this space is that I don't think that we've ever had anyone who's actually followed the pathway to know what the gaps might be. So in terms of data collection and lack of responses, we understand that um, just on that front of, uh, you know, in terms of research data collection, it looks problematic, but that in terms of qualitative data is a, is a real nugget, we think, because it really does speak to why there is such a gap in knowledge, because there might just not be enough infrastructure, enough people following the, the, the infrastructure we do have in order to, to establish uh, functional pathways. Oh, and so uh, <laughs> a word cloud of the, the surveys, or sorry, the um, interview uh, transcripts that we've got so far. It's really interesting that no and think are the most commonly used words in um, all of the transcripts. Um, the word pathway isn't really there. Um, it is smaller, it's, it's lesser represented, but yeah, no, think students. Um, are kind of the most commonly used ones. 
some initial analysis that we've done uh, with the coding that we've got. We had um, a few categories. Um, this, is, for those of you who cannot see, this is the, the word barriers. So anytime anyone mentioned any limitations or barriers uh, to pathways or students uh, succeeding in a pathway um, is where we coded to this. This is regional Indigenous, remote Indigenous, student agency. And this was support strategies. So I did an initial analysis of what support strategies people could identify. And you will see that barrier talk and support strategies um, and student agency are kind of an interesting correlation here in terms of the analysis of the transcripts. These are also assumptions at the end that I filtered for. And you'll see also that remote indigenous support strategies and barriers are also something that's really in common when people mentioned um, what we termed assumptions. And when I referred to that word, it was the fact that people were making statements either based on anecdotal or I know a person that this happened to and these types of things. So not exactly based on long um, longitudinal studies or research or anything like that, but people uh, making making kind of motherhood statements about um, what they thought they knew about the situation. So that was a really interesting finding. And of course, uh, because it's pathways at CDU, I made sure that I did an analysis for that across all of the categories that we've coded so far for. This is pathways potential, other RTOs, and aspirations are other categories that we mentioned. So support strategies at CDU, pathways at CDU, and barriers at CDU, of course, are the most common um, things we uh, found in the coding when it came to people mentioning things at CDU. So you can see from those three that barrier talk uh, was quite common. Uh, we also did some uh, desktop data analysis and collection across a number of different, uh, well, lots of different agencies. Um, so starting with CDU, in 2022, there are eight indigenous students enrolled according to the VET data. So uh, this is the problem that we're coming up against because there's enrollment data, but there's also engagement and completion data. Um, so that can be really misleading in terms of what successful pathways look like. Um, CERT for an education support, there were 21 Indigenous students enrolled. We, we think that this is, of course, not maybe CDU data, but probably representative across different uh, RTOs that, that collected that enrollment data. Um, three students enrolled at CERT three in education support and um, through vet and schools. And these two of these students have been identified as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So in terms of like what data is collected from which systems, there's the collective systems, uh, that are doing uh, vet in secondary school or vet in schools. There's um, independent RTOs, there's CDU, and then there's, of course, the CARA, which collects data across all. Uh, my school data um, listed two students enrolled in uh, Shepherdson College on Elko Island in CERT 3 and other education. We did a whole canvas of all the schools in the Northern Territory with my school data support, uh, support uh, data, and that was only in 2022. So that was really hard to filter through about where people were doing education support at schools. Um, and at ACARA, um, of course, education support is the second lowest program enrollment across Australia, uh, beating I think it's natural science or ecological science or science type of thing, which is really sad. <laughs> um, right. And then, of course, the number and proportion across the territory of uh, 15 to 9 year old, 19 year olds completing, completing at least one unit of competence at that two uh, or above. 2,600 men. Uh, males and 900 females, 700 of which were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So something that I did find in the my school data was that um, there were a lot of 
CERT 1 and CERT 2 was being completed, of course, at high school. Um, and a lot of that was uh, construction, retail, catering, food services, things like this, um, but very, very few, um, if any, education support. So in terms of enrollments, you can see the difference between enrollments and completions there, and um, confusing data that we've had to sift through and are continuing to still sift through. Um, now, this is the admission criteria for CBU's Bachelor of Education, um, primary and secondary. So there was a tertiary degree program. Uh, there is, pardon me, preparation for tertiary success, which has now been succeeded by uh, another kind of pilot. Um, there's personal competency statements, and there's also, um, pardon me, yes, a number of different, <laughs> is there three? level or higher, um, but in talking to people, people with a CERT 3 aren't really usually encouraged to enroll in a bachelor. They're encouraged to do uh, more enabling or bridging programs. So again, there's a lot of ways in, which is really encouraging, but how clear that is, is again, a little murky. Department mm -hmm. of Education. Data. So when we got approval from the department, they also approved data for us. So we requested a certain amount and type of data, and they came back with just one, just one little one chunk. And this this is what was provided exactly how they had provided. Yeah, the table there. And that, of course, includes uh, private RTOs in, as well as CDU. And there wasn't a breakdown of students for each one, so we weren't too sure. But there, we we developed this little picture from that data. Um, and of course, numbers for 22 uh, is unvalidated. Um, but you can see the steady rise and the you know, tripling of enrollments um, over the last few years. Is that for everybody? Or so, so sorry. So that that particular set of data goes beyond our scope. We're only looking at NT government schools, and we got um, other other school data included in that. So if we were to then only look at the department data, it would it would give you a different picture than than the whole entire. Um, set that's been provided to us. Is it Indigenous or everybody? Mm. Um, we asked for First Nations, so this is how it was provided to us, so the assumption is that that's First Nations. This is from CDU. This is of all First Nations students in Canvas uh, by Student Engagement and Success, and um, this is what UniStats has approved for us to use. Interestingly, um, this graph really tells a strong picture in terms of um, overall students from non-First Nations backgrounds in the blue here and First Nations backgrounds in the yellow. Uh, learner engagement um, in terms of positive responses got the lowest score. But the other, the other categories are teaching quality, student support, learning resources, skills development, and overall experience. So in terms of student engagement, there's some very subtle nuanced uh, breakdowns of the kind of scoring that was given. Um, as you can see, First Nations students uh, systematically, except for this category, um, rated just above uh, and higher than non-First Nations students. Question Is this? It says overall experience percentage positive. So, was this from data that all students had to complete? Only First Nations optional? students. Was it optional for them? I believe it was optional. Um, yeah. Um, we also have uh, this top piece of data here, um, which isn't related to this bit as well. There was um, a number of spreadsheets around retention uh, between 2007 and 2021. 
Um, and out of all those students, 623 First Nations students commenced an education related course, 155 completed. So that is still um, under the aligned with uh, the Mitsubishi finding in 2016 that 33% of First Nations students complete an education degree. Um, education related course being anything from diploma to post grad, however. So again, really hard to filter every little piece of data, and we're still working on that. Okay. Hmm. Uh, and this is from 2020 to 2021. 24.5% um, of non First Nations of, of First Nations students considered leaving um, due to paid work and study life balance. Whereas 22% of non First Nations students um, claims that their expectations were not met and the lack of academic support led to them considering leaving. So that's not surprising. That that's in line with other um, research that's been conducted. But it's the First Nations students who are most likely thinking of leaving before completion of their of their studies. This is interesting uh, from similar from the same survey, student engagement and success. Generic again, not ed, not education specific students, but um, across uh, the university and all the disciplines. But one identified as a bachelor of education course has been the support has been made available to me has been wonderful, helped me through a lot of um, personal situations. So the pastoral support was identified as really positive. Um, that online was better than their expectations, which was really encouraging, especially, you know, considering, the, you know, the, the online kind of experience that we're working on. And also the pressure of a classroom. So again, that's a really interesting um, aspect. And, and also, Indigenous support services was excellent, and Indigenous researchers. So in terms of kind of we're not actually talking about the actual education um, course that they were today. They were talking about. They're talking about all the experiences around that that were really um, positive. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Diana did uh, some desktop um, investigating of her own. So if someone was exploring through the internet, you know what could be the pathways or the information available. And um, in searching for being a teacher in the Territory, you know, it shows interestingly in the images that, you know, you could possibly be an assistant teacher, but you may have to be non-Indigenous to be the teacher. Something like that could be skewed from, you know, the, the representations given in the particular images available. So we were a little bit disappointed <laughs> in what was available, you know, for people. Because you know young people, the first thing they're going to do is Google. So this is what comes up. So if we move to the next slide, please. And then anything that's looking at a pathway um, the VET qualifications are usually directed to people uh, as giving them um, uh, information or qualifications for a career as an assistant teacher. It would be wonderful to see then if perhaps that is um, an entry into uh, an education qualification. Could you follow a pathway beyond um, being the assistant teacher? and into a more higher paid position of the teacher. So again, if you want to become a teacher, this is the kind of information that you're told, you know, if you completed a year 12, this is what you should do. So if you're going through the VET pathway, maybe, you know, that's not the information that you're looking for, you're looking for, okay, if you've completed these particular um, set three qualifications or heading through the VET pathway, what would be available to you? It directs you to SATAC and 
Um, Dr. Funk had lots of fun in <laughs> trying to explore what would, you know, is there anything pointing towards a degree that's easy for someone outside of the CDU system to understand how to actually get into it? It's a little bit of a barrier, the actual technology and the online sort of um, hurdles that you have to jump through to start with. In terms of like the amount of text that's available, yeah. yeah. The next page is the when they land on the SATAC stage. And it's like, contact us, give this, you know, and here's the address. There's, there's a phone number, but of course, it's the uh, So interestingly, one of the interview responses was, could there just be one contact person? <laughs> Guide people through the whole pathway into the degree um, enrollment. So that would be an interesting place to... Um, to start with when we're considering, um, you know, what other recommendations for support might be needed. So then, yes, so this tells you when you land at yeah, CDU. on the CDU page, yeah, what's required for initial teacher education. Or what's available. And it's accreditation information, so I'm sure the CDU has to comply with other um, criteria mm. when they have to list um, information like this, but it really does tell you a little bit about uh, what you know what information is represented and where where maybe it's targeted. And yeah. So if you're a young person thinking about being a teacher and you would really like to know clearly what's a pathway into teaching, these are the multitude of options available at the moment. So, you know, if you have completed your VET delivered in secondary school at set one or two, you can't get into a degree. Okay, you can't. You have to have, I think it's at least a set four to be considered for enrolment into the degree. So you have to try and manoeuvre through a number of different pathways depending on which program um, you're sort of starting in. For example, if you do a year 12, a traditional year 12, complete that, you have your ATAR score. However, you go through SATAC, you get in, you know, you enroll in a degree, that's okay. But what if you choose the VET pathway? How do you know how to get into eventually becoming a teacher if that's one of your aspirations? Or even if you think you're going to get into the VET pathway and you would love to begin being an assistant teacher, that's, you know, all well and good. But then once you're there and you decide, hey, you know, I reckon I could do that job, <laughs> how does that fun, you know? So where is that bridge or that link or connection that's very clear? So instead of having a map that looks like this, we're hoping to have one that's more defined and easier to follow. And um, so we're working with a graphic um, artist to also help us do that and to maybe um, eventually develop a pathway that has a few options in there and you could um, interact with it to then give you the next option for what you need to do. So that's what we're looking to do. That's one of our outcomes of our project, to clarify the pathway, but then to understand people's individual uh, options or um, choices. And then, you know, if this is where they are at the moment, this is where they move to next, how do they get to that end point? So um, there are different pathways articulated through existing programs. For example, RATE, so Remote Area Teacher, Remote Aboriginal Teacher Education um, funded program through the Department of Education. There's particular um, enrolments for remote educators and it's through a uh, diploma and very few, I think maybe one participant enrolled all the way into a degree. So it's still 
um, something that could be potentially helpful to other programs too if we clarify that pathway, strengthen it, but also highlight it as a potential option for people to come into teaching. Um, one aspect of REC that I know is that uh, principals in remote schools really love to make the most of the strength um, provided through community already. So a lot of the rate participants um, obviously are community members and they um, have been helping in the school for a number of years. So many of the rate students, participants, are older. So not necessarily um, the potential in that particular um, program for a younger cohort coming through yet that hasn't kind of eventuated so maybe our work might also clarify that for a younger cohort working in remote areas to think about their potential of becoming a teacher if that's their aspiration. So we have an advisory group to help us work through our project a very uh, experienced uh, researchers and we of course presented our information to them about our project and these are some of the questions that they had or some of the comments that they had. So pastoral versus academic support. So they asked about you know the survey responses or the interview responses. Was there a distinction between pastoral support and academic support and could we look a little bit more closely at that perhaps? What kind of levels of support is considered academic support by First Nations students? What kinds of levels of pastoral support is helpful? And then there's, um, there were repeated um, responses about gaps between particular qualifications. So if a student's completed their set one or two, that there's actually quite a leap in um, the uh, academic expectation of perhaps a Cert 3 and then maybe again if you go into the Cert 4. So some of those comments were made by colleagues obviously who work with supporting students and understanding um, the actual level of support that those students have needed when considering moving between particular uh, qualification. So that was interesting. Um, you know, what pedagogies might be considered? So do we need to think about how we support our students through um, not only enrolling, but then being successful in engaging with and staying? So that whole retention question of moving through to completing um, and being a teacher. And then learning and teaching from Indigenous researchers and cultural studies is helpful in making education programs more accessible. So um, some of the questions from our advisory group was um, maybe you should interview um, people who aren't necessarily just uh, lecturing or working in education, but look at lecturers more broadly in their support of, their successful support of First Nations students in working through to um, being successful or feeling successful or working through to their, um, their aspirations or potential. So do you want to pop back up and just say <laughs> So uh, just uh, to return back to our research questions. The first one, uh, is there a clear pathway? No, we know that so far. There's there's ways in and there's tools, but there seem to be many, many stepping stones along that pathway that you kind of need to know how to how to navigate in between. Uh, the enablers, culturally informed pedagogy and pastoral support, role models is another big uh big common comment about a, a support strategy um, that in, ensures students see themselves represented in the classroom and perhaps even online. Um, 
in images of teachers uh, having agency in the classroom and being leaders in their, um, not just in their community, but in a, in a, in a government school. Um, uh, analysis of the comments uh, shows there's not a lot of success in these pathways, um, but a lot of people have also mentioned that having a person or having in-person contact is a really beneficial um, strategy because uh, the isolation, I think, and then the, the amount of distance between where students kind of get that little glimmer of, I could do that, to actually, you know, getting to the end of a qualification, as we all know, is really difficult for a lot of students, let alone um, ones that are already disenfranchised by Western education. So, uh, there are uh, improvements to be made. Again, a person or a position needs to be established. Again, like the infrastructure of that pathway needs to be clarified. But I think along the way, like what Tracy said, in between those uh, certificate levels, there also needs to be something other than just clarity between the steps or like a pathway. There needs to be a, a kind of a qualitative difference to ensure that there's communication in kind of those both ways directions that isn't just about meeting certain certificate levels or like the land type qualification that everyone needs to complete at the end of a Bachelor of Education, language and learning, uh, language and literacy uh, and numeracy limitations are also a, a really big common barrier that was talked about. And, you know, after 40 years of education research and Indigenous education pathways, why is that still a, a problem that Western educators are, are, are naming? Anyway. Uh, the milestones, uh, next project milestone is again, completely diving into that data <laughs> again and trying to figure out our way through it um, because there are so many different ways that different organizations track students um, from department to CDU through the VET system. There's lots of different names for things. And so there's just a lot of, in terms of pathways at the moment, that data that data pathway is more of a maze for us that we still need to work out. Um, and yes, applying, applying for our next round of funding. Um, yeah, so okay. I think we pretty much covered most of that, haven't we? Yeah. A lot of stuff, yeah, again, um, our staff being, um, our, our colleagues here at CDU being the biggest respondents to the survey, still not a lot of clarity or consistency. A lot of really, really good intentions and aspirations to know, but there seems to be different pockets of knowledge that, again, pathways between our, our colleagues in understanding how to support and then retain Indigenous uh, pre-service teachers.